Hey guys, welcome. Uh, apologize for this background noise. When the sun's out, I rarely get a chance to go outside. So I try to take every possibility of going outside and enjoying it. Um, <clears throat> it's nice. It's, it's warm. It's not too warm. And where I'm sitting, I'm on my pool deck. So it, uh, the sun, it's, I have about an acre and a half of woods behind me. So what happens is when the sun sets down at like 3.30, it's clockwork sun goes away and it's above the hillside and it's in the back of the yard so I don't get much sun, sunset in this area. So it's perfect time right now because the sun is not beating down on me which I like but not when I'm trying to do a video. So how's everybody doing this week? I hope everyone had a pleasant week last week. Um, I knew last week was a little crazy um, as well as this week. Uh, there's so much going on personally for me um, and at Point Park University. So uh, my apologies on a late lecture, but uh, what I didn't want to do is just send you a PowerPoint and say here, um, that's not me. Um, sometimes I'll put it, I, I, not sometimes, I always put in the, the extra effort to make the class as smooth as possible. But the important thing to me is that you learn something from taking the class. So that's the reason, apologize for the delay, but I'd rather be late and give you a uh, lecture of me talking to you and make it a more visual versus me giving you a PDF or a PowerPoint saying, here, read this. Um, to me, I don't get anything out of that and you probably won't get anything out of it either at that point. So hopefully everyone had a good week. Uh, this is some good stuff happening. I mean, not great stuff. We're moving into the green stage come this Friday. Um, hopefully that uh, is a little relaxing to people's mind based off of what happened this past weekend with the riots. Uh, we were actually in Pittsburgh, we were on Mount Washington, Mount Washington doing a drone f uh, f filming and didn't even realize how bad it was in the city. And personally, I had forgotten about the uh, protesting and so forth. So anyways, Friday, good day, moving into the green. So finally get a chance to enjoy restaurants. I personally had gone to my first restaurant last weekend uh, not this past weekend, but the weekend before that in Ohio. So sat out at two restaurants. So it felt a little weird, but it felt good, finally. So enough about me. Um, I'll talk about this week, which, which is Module 5. Um, so this week we're going to learn something new, and I'll have a lab that I'll post later as well that will be available for you to do this. And it was important for me to also do this video with uh, some type of video. I want you guys, like I said, I want it to be – as real as possible. All right, moving into this week five, module five. So this week we're going to talk about model visuals, storytelling, pulling it all together. So at this point we've did everything like in little blocks, little uh, pieces, and so it's like putting all the little pieces that you learn and merging it together in one big story. And that to me has been a, my entire life with software development. You learn a little piece of it. I'll give you an actual example. So, uh, Point Park University, um, we uh, last semester spring computer science uh, department, we uh, formed a relationship with a uh, company called the Family House. They're outside of Oakland. Uh, they have a great service. It's a nonprofit organization. So my students and another professor's students merged together. Part of my students developed the app. The other students did a front end with the two consolidated together. So everyone's working in little silos and we're merging a product together. But what happened is in my class, we had a lot of new technologies, a lot of new programming languages, but only five students. So that limit the stuff that we could get done. So now myself and the other professor are finishing the, the, the product for the customer. And so this evening we're actually doing a, a live demo with them on the iOS uh, platform. Um, so different pieces we're able to do. so. Um, at the beginning, after our call last month, I wrote the uh, notification process, all the remote notifications um, within like three days. Um, so we have all that. And then we have these other pieces completed. So now we're waiting for a developer license. And so we have all these little silos. And then we could finally, hopefully here within the next two weeks, we could merge everything into one big project, product, and then it'll be, re be available to the customer very soon, shortly afterwards, which is important. Um, so anyways, that's kind of what we're doing here. We're doing these little pieces, we're merging it together, we're making a 
ultimate product. All right, so uh, weekly visual summaries. Well, at this point, you have did the summaries uh, by YouTube or, or uh, Vimeo or whatever. Uh, model visuals, storytelling, pulling it all together, next week lab work, lab week, lab work, blah. This would be your part, but <clears throat> maybe next week I'll do do this and provide everyone's. There'll be one week that I'll take everyone's, uh, and I'll get your authorization, but I'll take everyone's uh, summaries and I'll do them at the beginning of class and do them in my lecture as real as possible. So model visuals, a lot of bugs out here. Uh, we've talked about the, some of the basics um, that uh, are more effective for visualization. Um, let's look at several model visuals using lessons that we covered. And I hope this background noise is not too loud for everybody. Uh, so model visual, um, line graph. This right here is a, a good example because it shows the annual giving campaign progress. So it shows uh, the pro progress at the current state, which is okay, how much money they've already uh, provided and where they want to go to. What's, what's the status? Now looking at this, uh, model right here. This tells me a really good um, understanding. It provides me the current state of mind where we're at, where we're trying to accomplish. Where's that line? So where's that bar? So you set your you set your guidelines of where you, you go. So let's say that you raise thirty eight thousand this year. That's your bar. So next year you're going to want to keep increasing that bar. You don't want to decrease. But data will show how your year has gone. So for example, like my company I work for, they I'm sure they set the bar. Um, high every year and each year really I see the f past five or six years they've at least increased their uh, their um, uh, their compensation not a compensation but their um, I can't even get out how much money they earn uh, per year so what was the amount that they earned for their company so each year they've gone up like a billion or two billion um, at all the companies I've ever worked for this one is the most profit um, like last year, I think they made $42 billion. And I think t the year before that, it was $38 billion. So they increased by 4%. Um, and so it's kind of like this scale. You can easily tell how much um, your company is profit over a period of time. So that's important. And this is a really good graph. And if you tell a good story, and that story is a good showing how maybe where something started at and where it could get, get at, um, is very helpful. Another example, I have a lot of examples. Uh, so one of my uh, clients in the past, the uh, organization I worked for, uh, our client was uh, Discover, Discover Card. And when we initially sold them what we could do for their website, so what we were doing was search engine marketing, we were uh, strategizing ways to increase performance on certain areas within the market. And we were only focusing on the East Coast. So like from Pittsburgh up to like I would say Maine, I'd say Boston, and maybe the south is uh, Orlando, Miami, so forth. And we were focusing on traffic in those areas. And so what we did is we started where we thought we set the bar at, and we did a graph similar to this, and we said, this is what we think we can make for you. And it was a lot of BS, I think, at first. We were just basing off of what we were kind of hoping, but we weren't real sure but that's that's how you start off you have to you have to create the baseline and once you have a baseline you can go from there uh, in a short period of time we were able to increase the revenue by 40 percent uh, within I say the first three to six months and then after the next one to two years two to three years we're able to um, really take over that market um, I get to the point where we initially started they would spend about five hundred thousand a year on Paid search engine marketing with us and, and then they would spend a certain amount on organic search which is free but we do a lot of leg work a lot more work but on paid search they were spending the thing about paid search is you could put all your money in one bucket and if someone goes out there and you know doesn't if that the keywords and certain things are not utilized properly you could kind of be burnt within a week or two so you have to make quick wise decisions so long story short but Providing a good story, we were able to increase their revenue by, um, I'm trying to remember, it was like 40, 50, 60 million dollars. And so at the end of the day, by the time I left the company, we they were spending north of 20 million dollars a month um, with us 
So, you know, we got a percentage of, of that. Um, so, good stuff. Tell a good story. That'll be you next. That was only one visual. Um, so, this one right here, I'm going to throw my glasses on because it's a little small print for me. Uh, so, as you see here, the sales over time, they showed you here 2006 to 2009. So, this is the same thing with Discover. We could have provided them, hey, over the next, over three to six months, we increased uh, your profit by 4%. And then in the next two to four years, we went up by this percent. Providing these numbers to people are very effective because at the end of the day, the people making the decisions, they just want to look at the numbers. They don't want to look at the details. They want to understand what are you presenting to me? What am I going to make? And basically, how am I going to go wealthier? That's the end of the story. I mean, that's if you go, watch the Shark Tank. See how they do it on a Shark Tank, how they ask them, what are you making right now? What are your sales? What are you forecasting your sales? How are you getting those numbers? That's important because a company wants to know that you're not BSing them and providing the right graph is sensational. It could be very effective. Uh, number three, stack bars. So this one right here is very interesting. This could be, I've seen something like this used in different areas. So this one right here shows your miss, your meets, and your exceeds. So we use something similar to this. Uh, so. Uh, in my two week uh, sprints with, with my uh, engineers. So one of the things is we take on so many different uh, opportunities within the, in our sprints. And right now we're at the end of the uh, fiscal year. And so a bar like this provides me each sector. So for example, I own six different services and the different services has different people to work on them. Um, so the one service has three uh, individuals to work on it. So I'm able to base the percentage of the project, how the project did over uh, a course of a month, and then also base it off of each individual, how that person did, based off at the time that they spent on on, on the uh, on the work that they were working on. Um, overall, what I am doing, um, I'm trying to tell a story. And so what my story is, so each month we hit, well, every two weeks we had to do something called a two-week sprint. So every month we're doing two, well, two sprints, four weeks, and Every quarter, we're doing certain things. So what we do is high level, we create these things called milestones that you guys are probably well familiar with. And in milestones, it's things that we want to accomplish over the year, but we break them down by quarters. And so what I'm doing is at the end of each sprint or each quarter, I'm presenting a story. And my story is right now is, it's not a good story to be honest with you. Um, the past eight weeks, we have not, uh, and this is, and this could be my, my fault. Um, I take the blame um, on this one. We've not surpassed 45% of our um, sprints. Well, what that means is based off the, the awesome graphs that I put together, we're using, uh, uh, actually, we're not using Tableau. We're using something called EZBI. So it's a product that's integrated with one of our services. And Tableau would be pretty good. Um, but any, anyhow, uh, over that period of time, that means that the work that we're working on has not been effective. I mean, it's been effective, but we have, we've taken on more than we can take, basically. It's like, you know, you go to a restaurant, Chinese, uh, there's an awesome Indian restaurant downtown right off of Point Park campus, awesome food. Um, and sometimes you go in there with these big eyes and you're hungry, you're like, I could take on all this food. At the end of the day, you know, you just, you can't stand, you can't, there's no way. And that's exactly what's happening uh, here is we have to come up with a more and we're working on a more efficient way of doing it. Make sure that people have the right amount of work and we're, we're, we're at the end of the day, we want to tell a good story. And the story wants to be, hey, we completed X, Y, and Z over this period of time. Here's our huge milestones. <coughs> that ultimately, ultimately looks good. Right now, from a leader standpoint, it doesn't make me look good and it doesn't make my manager look good as well. So anyhow. These don't lie, they tell the truth. Uh, this right here, uh, model visual number four, <coughs> excuse me, positive and negative stack bars. So this is also effective. It could show you a population over time where things are can be positive or negative based off the use. What I'm looking for you guys and ladies is this week is to tell me out of the different visuals that we're using, I wanna understand how you find them to be effective. And this will be like more of a discussion question. How do you find them to be effective? And where would you, which ones out of 
So we're going to go through five of them here. I want you to think about which ones that you would say in your current line of work, what you do currently today, um, where, which one would you find to be more um, usable? What would be more helpful in your line of work? Now, you don't have to specify the name of your company. Your company could be XYZ. I don't care. Um, I'm curious, and this will be a discussion, for you to pick one of the five graphs uh, that would be more effective in your job and why it would be more effective. Um, would all five of them be effective? Or would a one specific one? Um, and it could be based off uh, the line of work that you work in. So you work in marketing, you work in HR, maybe HR uses something else. So it all depends. Number five, horizontal stack bars. Um, top 15 development priorities. So this is pretty effective. And, and this right here is also good. We do something similar as well, where we have priorities, which are our milestones. And then we have the percentage of that milestone that we have accomplished over a period of time. So lessons in storytelling, plays, cinema, written word, um, Point Park. You know, we have plays, lots of plays. Uh, cinema, um, you have to tell a good story. Um, you can, like I said, at the beginning of this uh, lecture, I'll make sure I'm recording. Uh, I could have easily sent you that PowerPoint, this PowerPoint, and kind of went to town and said, you're on your own, but that's not my, uh, that's not what I do. And my thing is missing, so that's awesome. Where is that screen flow? I gotta make sure I'm recording. So if I'm not, that would be sad. All right, so I am recording, so that's awesome. All right, um, play from this, uh, play from current side. All right, something popped up on my end and made me think I wasn't. All right, storytelling in plays. A three-act structure for plays. The first act, set up the story. Uh, this, so the first step is setting up the story. So you're sitting around, let's say, for example, I'm sitting around with um, some of my leadership team. Um, so myself and the other managers are sitting around. We're like, hey, this is what we've accomplished um, this quarter off of milestones. We we were able to, for example, we were able to expand our services. These are real stories. We were able to expand our one service over to Australia and within that period of time we were able to bring them up to speed teach them and basically cut ourselves off completely where they're doing all the support and they're running a service that we did so that's a huge accomplishment we're in the process of doing that now in Europe then the other service that we offer and that service is um, called secret service um, it's actually it's uh, if you ever use LastPass on your phone like when you save a, a password and it saves it um, it's kind of like that, but at a more detail level and a lot more involved. Um, and then we have this other service that scans all the vulnerabilities on, on your application. And so that service, we're right now we're only based in the U.S. And we're trying to base our services in other territories, per se. And that right there itself could be um, your first act of your story. Is Here's what I've accomplished. Let's talk about Let's put it on a paper. Let's brainstorm and figure out how we're going to tell a story with that. The second act is makes up the bulk of your story. What's the portion, the, the major part of your story that you're trying to tell? What is it? And then ultimately the third act is receive the story and subplot. So you know how the story is going to go, you know how it's going to end, so forth. So a good story is uh, think of any type of situation that you've did in work. Um, think of a, a situation where you, um, you've taken on a big challenge. Uh, there was a lot of risk involved, and you knew that, but you wanted to prove to yourself that you could do the job, but also that uh, you could take on all these critical tasks and, and, and do it in a short period of time, or even a long period of time. Uh, I've worked on a project where, personally not here, but other companies, uh, where I was faced with, um, Think about things I was I was faced with only three team members. I had a project manager. I was a lead developer. I had a, a senior software engineer working with me. I had a business analyst, and then I had the support of the business, and then I had support of the other services that I needed. And originally, they're like, "Hey, this project, we need you to complete it within uh, six to eighteen months." So I'm thinking more toward the eighteen month span, and and then. Uh, 
when someone comes to you and the business comes to you and says, okay, we want it done in six months. And you know that personally it can't be done in six months. And, and you know right off the bat what that means. That, that, mean, that entails that you're going to be working a lot of hours. So you think about this story. So you have to think about this story, how that story is going to go. And you tell the story, hey, this is how it started. This is how it ended. I'm not going to go into detail. It was a, a crazy story. But we, we, made, we actually we were able to do it in probably four months. But we didn't want it complete in four months because – they know that the next project would have been in two months. So you see where I'm going. So you got to play it the best way you can. Um, three act structure can act as a model for communicating. Uh, conflict and tension are a big part of the story. There's going to be conflict. Especially in that story that I just told you. There was a lot of conflict. Um, we had a person on our team I'll put it that way person uh, he or she so it could have been a either uh, spend most of their time at the casino when they were supposed to be at work so that was a challenge for us because we were losing hours and you know we didn't have time to babysit and figure out whether this person was really at the casino it was just hearsay from other people whether it was true or not it ended up being true but uh, nonetheless we lost a lot of time on that because then myself and others had to commit extra time and so those are things that tensions run high and you're not their favorite fan and that's what happens um so these are things that you have to think about when you're telling your story storyteller is telling in cinema so robert mckee author story says there are two ways to persuade this uh the conventional theory typical powerpoint slides in business that's what a lot of people use that's what i'm using PowerPoint. Uh, filled with bullet points and facts. Uh, this becomes an intellectual exercise while you're trying to persuade them. And they may not agree uh, if you convince them. So this is what I've learned. And this is an actual example, a real life example. I apologize, I'm being paged. Oh, someone needs my approval. One moment, my apologies. I have to prove something. Yes, I approve it. Hmm. Oh, come on. Perfect. All right. Um, all right. So, typical PowerPoint. Um, so when I did my lecture, lecture when I did my, I also have a meeting with a student and four o'clock too. Sorry, I'm all over the place. My apologies. That's my typical life. That's what happens when you teach full-time, uh, and uh, work full-time. Anyhow, uh, so when I did my uh, demo for to get the job at Point Park as a professor, uh, they gave me a topic. Um, it was like a week out before the interview, and it was a topic on JavaScript. So that was the topic. I had to teach a class, and I didn't know whether it was going to be faculty. I didn't know if it was going to be students. I didn't know what it was going to be. It was faculty. And I had to teach faculty that didn't know anything about JavaScript. So the way I went into that is I didn't want to do a slide with all the code and all this stuff because to me, that had been boring. That would have been too much. So what I did is, and it took a lot of time, is I added a lot of images. I made images from, wow, I'm shocked, to, wow, that's awesome, to, I'm excited. So I showed ways to write JavaScript. I introduced what JavaScript was. I walked through high levels. I didn't do everything. And I showed, hey, if you do this, this is when something bad could happen. And then like showed like an exploit where you know, a hacker is over there hacking. The whole idea concept here is provide images, lots of images, um, positive and negative, and less just, you could have bullet points, do high levels, 
to do more like I'm doing right here. I have a little bit of information. I'm doing more talking than information. If you have that, that tells a better story because you limit your reader from having to read all this information on the screen and pro provide them more context by talking to them. That will win it every time. But don't talk too much like I'm doing. All right, so moving on. Uh, second way is through your story. Stories unite an idea with emotion. Um, a story expression of how, why life changes. I'll give you a real example story. I'm not going to tell his story. But uh, last Friday, so every day we do a, a daily stand-up at noon. Um, like I said, everyone in my group is in different uh, time zones. Uh, so at noon Eastern time, we do a, a daily stand-up for 25 minutes. And it's just to talk about the work that we're working on. So Friday, I think it was Friday or Thursday. I don't remember which day it was. Um, it was an emotional one. Um, all the stuff that's going on, like I said, I have people on my team that are all in different um, parts of different continents. And everyone's facing a different, um, a different struggle in life, not just work, in life. And it's, and we had this one guy, he was so excited about his son. He was just so amazed by the challenges that his son has and how he worked through it. And he's just a little kid, I think, uh, preschool. And he told his story. It was so uplifting. He was bawling. I was tearing up. And everybody on the team was kind of crying. It was just so powerful of that story. And after that, you didn't want to do anything for the rest of the day. You were just like, wow. And my coworker who couldn't make it, she messaged me and said, how was the meeting? I says, I can't even describe it. I said, we all cried. And she thought I was kidding. I was like, no, we all cried. It was amazing. So getting back to this, by telling a good story, bringing the user into your story, that's how you'll succeed. And that's how you help people out. So tell a good story. Make it a good one. Catch, get, get, make them interested. It's like making a movie. You don't want to go to a movie and see something boring. You want to see something exciting. Okay, moving on. Um, <coughs> kind of already talked about this. Storytelling from a master. So McKee goes on to say stories can be revealed asking a few questions. So, what was Basically, what order do you want to restore balance in his or her life? What is the core need? What is, I'm not going to read all this stuff verbatim. These are just examples. Do I believe this story? Um, can you provide suggestions and so forth? So it's important to write these questions out. Figure out what, what, your, what your motive is, what you want to get out of it. Takeaways. We can use stories to engage audience emotionally. Think of a stand-up comedian. Uh, think about how you go in there and they could just, boom. Obviously, excuse me, they have to prepare for that and be ready for it. But it takes a lot on them. Me, I couldn't do that. Um, first time I stood up in a class teaching was 2015. Um, I got my first job teaching college as an adjunct at uh, community college, uh, CCAC. And so I didn't know how I was going to take on, I had an idea what I was going to do and my takeaways and so forth. Uh, but when I went into the classroom, I was kind of a little sh shocked at first. I was a little timid. There was about 35 people in the class and there was more people than I thought. And it was just like, it took me a few weeks to really get used to that environment because it was a new envir environment to me. Yeah, of course I was in school too, but it, it's different when you're sitting on the other side of the fence per se. So um, that's another topic. And now it's, to me, I, the only thing I, I wish is I wish that I had the opportunity to teach one of those big, uh, uh, big auditoriums, hundreds and hundreds of people, one of those classes. I think that'd be fascinating. Uh, storytelling and written word. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I gotta put my glasses back on. Find a subject that you care about. If it's genuine, caring, and not your games of language, 
which will be most comp um, compelling and uh, seductive element in your style. Do not ramble. That is important. Um, I've seen so many times work in industry when someone asks you a question, you're like, uh, um, yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Give me an example. <laughs> it was like my first semester teaching at CCAC, and they in every semester they do a survey of how you did. And I read the survey, and it said, uh, Professor Seaman uses um too much. I'm like, I do? My wife's like, yeah, absolutely, you do. I'm like, so what I did the next semester, I recorded my lectures. And so I go back, and I listen to them. I'm like, holy heck, I used um 37 times in the first 30 minutes. So I tried to teach myself to not use that word um, so which think how many times I use it here because it shows that you are not prepared and you don't have the right answer and there's a better answer instead of using the word um try to think quick off of your feet it's important because if you have a job interview they're going to ask you questions that you're not going to be really prepared for and you need to come up with a quick solution and even if you have to just think of something that happened six weeks ago six minutes ago a month ago a year ago do it don't stop and say go um or yeah well so what happened is you don't want a, 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 a slow storyteller you want you want to hear you want to have it quick and we live in a society where we think we need things quickly we don't like waiting around we want them like now yesterday five minutes ago all right so that's me keep it simple uh i'm sorry i apologize i'm moving around here i'm been sitting here i'm very uh, uncomfortable at this moment. Uh, let's see here. All right, moving on. Have guts to cut it. If a sentence, no matter how excellent, does not illuminate your subject in some new or useful way, scratch it out. Don't use it. Sound like yourself. So be yourself. Don't go in there with the voice and, hey, this is me, this is how I'm telling my story. Don't Tell the story in your own voice. Don't use someone else's voice. Don't try to be someone else. Be yourself. That is that makes makes you successful. Uh, say what you say what you mean. Break it out. Uh, pity the readers. Our audience requires us to be sympathetic and patient. Teachers over willing, simplify, clarify, blah blah blah. Like I said, at the end of the day, just be yourself. So, constructing a storytelling. As you can see where this week's going. The setting, when and where does the story take place? So, well, obviously we all want the story to take place probably on the beach. Me, uh, there's a beautiful place off the island. I've mentioned it before, Seattle, called Friday Harbor. I would like it to take place there. But that's just me. Who's the main character? Who is driving the action? This would be framed in terms of your audience. Who is this individual? What is... He or she trying to accomplish what's the imbalance why is it necessary what has changed the balance what do you want to see happen what's what's the example and I'll give you guys examples in a minute and the solution how will you bring about the changes so this is really cool so we and I go back to this area where I would love to be at Friday Harbor and Google it there's a place called Lime Kiln Park uh, it is Lime Kiln State Park, and it's on, on the, let me see here, so it, uh, see, yes, it's on the west side, it's like, it's like Midwest, it's in the west, it would be like, if you went to San Francisco, it's like right there, but in Friday Harbor, and so it's a, it's a, it's a rinky dinky small little um, uh, tower um, that, you know, people, they have scientists, biologists, whatever, go there and do all the reporting and analysis on uh, the uh, southern residents, which are uh, orca whales, killer whales. I uh, think there might be 72 left. A lot, some of them are in captivity, some have passed on, whatever the case is. Um, lighthouse, that's what I was trying to say, lighthouse. And to me, that's a fascinating place. My wife and I would go there for hours and sit there and take wine. And, and, the, and the thing... With, that people did is because that's where the, um, the residents, the, where the orcas would go up. So typically on a typical day, they would travel north and they would be heading up to British Columbia 
And so they were heading up to get their feast, which was uh, salmon. They only eat a certain salmon. I think it's called the Chinook salmon that comes out of Oregon. And so sometimes what happens is there's a dam and it's kind of blocking the Chinook from getting there. So they have to travel further up to British Columbia, uh, different parts like Vancouver and so forth. Anyways, long story short, they go up and they go down. So being able to catch them go north or south is absolutely incredible. And so the first time that we went to the island in 2015, I had my big long camera uh, with the lens and stuff, and I was taking pictures. I sat there for, they came through, we sat there for six hours just taking photos. And it was the most incredible experience that I had ever did. And I had never thought that me going and watching Orca Wells, um, my wife's loved them since she was like a baby. And I never thought that would be something I liked. And I got all these spy hops and these different, um, different things. Um, different positions, I don't know what they're called, uh, that they were doing. And it was absolutely incredible. And it was amazing. This animal was human-like, very human-like, uh, just like us. And they're very smart, smartest, uh, uh, smartest animal in the sea. Uh, amazing, absolutely incredible. But just going there and just uh, being able to tell people about this island, and it's all about, it's all about the orca well. It's all about the well there, and that's what it's always about. And so... Anyways, me telling you this story, I'm telling you about a story about the setting, where it's located, um, the surroundings. Uh, main character is the killer well. Um, the imbalance, why is it necessary? What has changed? Well, it's what's changed here is they're unable to get that certain salmon that they want. So they have to sometimes disappear for weeks at a time where they will not go, travel through. So what would, so what would be the solution here? The solution would be, to come up with a solution that in Oregon, where these uh, dams are at, they're able to release the Chinook salmon to the customer, which is the Orca well. But there's a lot of challenges around that because they can't knock the dam down because the dam's there to, uh, it, um, sorry, it produces energy for the little town there. So there's a lot of variables that happen. So it's like on the border of, it's in Oregon, but it's on the border of uh, Washington State. So, tell a good story. Uh, constructing a story, I'm probably very far behind, guys. Okay, we're on slide 20 of 28, so I go too much. Well, we've been talking for a long time. Oh, my computer's running down. Alright, where am I at? See where my camera's at. All right. All right. So I don't see my camera. Where did it go? I know there's a button to knock this off. Hmm. Sorry, I want to keep going, but. If I lose this, I'll figure it out. Anyways, I'll continue and I'll go from there. All right. Um, so constructing a uh, story in the middle, further develop the situation or problem, uh, incorporate external context or comparison points, give examples that illustrate the issue, include data that demonstrates the problem, articulate what will happen if no action is taken or no change is made, Discuss potential options for addressing the problem. Illustrate benefits of your recommendation, um, your recommended solution, and make it clear to your audience why they are a unique position and what makes this decision drive. So ultimately what we're doing here is you're going to come up with a problem. You're going to talk about your problem. But I want it to be real. I want it to be straight from the heart. I don't want to be something that you found on the Internet. I want you to make this up on your own. That's what makes a good story. Um, what's the call to action? Visuals may fall flat without compelling narrative to go with it. Think about the order in which you want your audience to experience your story. A key point is your story must have to order it. The path should be clear. Help me turn this into a story. Start with a big idea and a three-minute story. Three minutes. If you had only three minutes to tell your audience 
what they need to know, what would you say? Big idea. That boils down. So what? Down to a single sentence. Think of a single sentence that could really caption. A single sentence that says one thing. What would that cap caption be? What could it be? Um, thinking out, out of... I'm not prepared for this myself, so thinking um, out of the box on um, me, I would say wine, W-I-N-E. What does that mean? Well, I could say anything about wine. I could talk about how I make it. I could talk about the love I have by making it, the process, um, how you could turn a fruit, spoil it, and turn it into alcohol within 7 to 21 days talk about how you could do so many different things with it I could go on I love talking about it uh, so I could go on forever so that is something have that one word be able to talk about that be able to be quick about it three minute story here's an example a group of us are in the science department we're brainstorming about how to resolve an ongoing issue <coughs> that we have with incoming fourth graders it seems that when kids get their first science class they come in with this attitude is going to be difficult and they aren't going to like it. It takes a good amount of time at the beginning of the school year to be on, to go be, get beyond that. So we thought, if, what if we try to give kids exposure to science sooner? Can we influence their perception? We pilot, piloted a learning program last summer aimed at doing just that. We invited elementary school students and ended up with a large group of second and third graders. Our goal was to give them early exposure to science in hopes we were forming positive perception. To test whether we were successful, we surveyed the students before and after the program. We found that going into the, into the program, the biggest segment of students, 40% felt okay. Um, about science, whereas the um, after the program, most of them shifted to more toward the 70%. So, in a nutshell here, um, three-minute story is, I can tell you a story about, not about wine, but about computer science. Um, how students in my class are like, I don't know why I'm even in this. And I think the perception of computer science in general, show them what it can do. And this is what we try to do when we do the, uh, um, oh, geez, I can't remember the name of it. But uh, when we do the seminars or whatever you call it, uh, show them what we've developed. Show them the cool things. Show them the apps. Show them the things with the Raspberry Pi. Show them the technology communicating with the uh, iPhone, communicating with the cameras communicating with Alexa show it off right away then it catches their eye like whoa that's really cool if you start off and say you got to write this code and that code to do this and that yeah I'm, I'm lost already don't make it boring make it exciting and make them want to learn big idea the pilot summer learning program was successful at improving students perception obviously turn this into stories so start with a slide that has your main bullet points. This becomes your executive summary. And we all know what executive summary is. Um, it tells the whole story at the beginning. And it tells uh, basically an overview of everything without your, within your story. And, and they could, you could read the executive summary and have an understanding of what you're, what's happening here. And then organize slides to follow this flow. Uh, chronologically, uh, lead with an ending. A uh, spoken, written narrative, if you're giving a perception, whether formal or informal, most likely to be uh, spoken, most likely to be spoken. An email or report is likely written narrative. Each presents challenges. Uh, spoken narrative, um, written narrative, power repetition. I'm not going to go into a classic repetition technique. Tell the audience what you're going to tell them. Executive summary, summarize it. Tactics to ensure your story is clear. Horizontal logic. Vertical logic, reverse, etc. Um, I'm just going on and on. Fresh perspective, uh, closing closing your story, pulling it all together, understanding the context, choosing the appropriate display, eliminating the clutter. So we're taking everything together. Draw attention where you want it to be. Think like a designer. Tell a story.
One example right here. Prices declined for all products in the market since the launch of Product C in 2010. Understand the context. Let's assume who... Oh, geez, all my stuff's taken off. Um, understand how competitors' pricing has changed over a period of time. Show an average of retail price over A, B, C, and D, and E. Uh, choose an appropriate display. I guess there was more slides. Choose an appropriate display. Eliminate the clutter. Draw attention. I'm kind of going through it quick. Where we want it to be. Draw attention where we want it. Draw attention where you want it. Think like a designer. Tell a story. Kind of go through this quickly now. Um, a lot of this is the same stuff that we talked about. So watch for me in the next video. Um, that'll be the, the, the lab and it'll be more elaborate than what we're doing here. So week visuals do obviously case studies, final thoughts on storytelling, reference sites. So uh, I'll send another video. It'll be the lab. It'll be later this evening. And it'll be more detailed to what we're trying to accomplish this, this, this week. This should be a really fun week. Um, so that's it. Um, that's it for the week. Thank you for watching. Hopefully I can figure out how to end this. And have a good day. Bye for now. If I can find my thing here.